As far back as I can remember, I was terrified of the dark, terrified of the night, and really terrified at the thought of ever, ever having to live alone. And as other kids grew out of their nighttime terrors, I did not. And the nightly ritual of having to go to the bathroom and facing the figure behind the curtain, breathing raspily, or the woman facing me down in my bed, paralyzing me with her eyes while she whispered at me, didn't change year after year after year. And so I had to come up with a plan. And it didn't help that I was an early and avid reader and that I loved Stephen King. <laughs> but still, I had a plan. And so I left home and I went to college. I had roommates. And when I finished at the University of Colorado Boulder, my next plan was to move in with my boyfriend, Rob, who was a very hairy and very beautiful herbalist who lived out of his orange VW van. <laughs> I left for the summer, I moved to Martha's Vineyard and lived with my sister in a cottage among the beetlebung trees and the tall grass, dude and laden with ticks, and spent my nights dreaming of my future life with Rob. And as I took off at the end of the summer, in my 1973 Plymouth Gold Duster with imitation rattleskin roof, <laughs> among the sandy road to catch the ferry, I hit a rabbit, and an unceasing shrieking cry pierced through the mixtape that my friend had made me. And I stopped the car paralyzed, unsure what to do. I got out of the car looking for it, but not wanting to find it. I thought I should put it out of its misery and knew that I was incapable of doing so. And so I got back in the car and I drove away, the songs taking on a very sinister tone. And I had read enough Stephen King to know what fair foreshadowing was. <laughs> and that what was coming was not going to be according to plan. <laughs> and when I pulled up in Boulder at 19th and Pine and saw Rob sitting on the stairs, I just knew that it was over. He had met a young Mahonia, a beautiful, soulful herbalist. And so I installed myself up in, up in Nederland at my friend's house and cried day after day until my, fam my friend Cameron suggested gently that it was time for me to find a place to live. <laughs> and so I found a cabin on the side of Mount Or Thorodin at 10,000 feet at the top of Cold Creek Canyon. And I moved in with Stephanie, a perky 25-year-old, and her boyfriend, James, an actor. And we were not friends, but I was not living alone. And so I would drive home at the end of the, each day in my 1973 Plymouth Gold Duster and soon found out that it is not a mountain car. <laughs> and so I went, when I would come back at night, I would have to park at the base of this very steep hill and trudge up through the dark, and I would sing to myself to drown out my growing dread. But I survived until one day I came home from work and Stephanie and James had completely emptied out the house. She had had an accident. She had gone off of South Beaver Creek, totaled her car, and told James to clear out the house. And so there I was, 20 years old, facing my worst nightmare. I was on the side of a mountain in a house where I could not see another neighbor, completely alone. And I had the worst night of my life, I kid you not. And the next morning, I woke up in the dark only to realize that the shovel that I needed to dig out my car was gone with Stephanie. And so I made my, my way down behind the cabin to the little storage space where I thought I had seen an old tin rusty shovel. And I made my way through the dark, heart beating fast. And as I fumbled through the dusty, dank space, looking for the light, I brushed up against something furry and huge, and I screamed and I jumped back, and then I felt the cord of the light against my neck, and I furiously grabbed for it, and I turned on the light, and then I saw before me a massive white bunny suit <laughs> that James had left behind. So I grabbed the bunny suit and I grabbed the shovel and I went back upstairs.
And I have to tell you honestly that my life changed that day. And for any of you that have not experienced incapacitating and unreasonable fear well into your adulthood, it might be difficult to understand. But when I came home that day, I put on the bunny suit. <laughs> and I went out into the woods. And I hopped. <laughs> and I ran. And I crouched. And then that became a ritual day after day. <laughs> I would run through the woods. And I'd go to this outcropping of rocks. And I would sing madrigals or recite poetry or yodel. And I went on that like that for a while and then it was time to move out and I restored the bunny suit down to the storage space for someone else to find and I didn't think about it again for 23 years. I got married. I divorced. I got married again. I got divorced again later but I had a, I had a child in that time and one day I took my 12 year old daughter up to the cabin to see the house. And I pulled at the end of the driveway because mountain people generally do not like people encroaching on their space. And as we were leaving, a gray-haired man pulled up behind my car and got out and said, can I help you? And I explained who I was and that I used to live there. And he grew quiet. And as I turned to get in the car, he said, excuse me, I'm sorry to bother you. I, I, I have something to ask you. I was like, sure. Turned back around. And he said, you know, around the time that you lived here, neighbors reported someone in a white bunny suit, and no one knew who it was. And I'm so sorry to ask you this, but I just, I have to, I have to know, was it you? And memories flooded back to me of rocks and trees and the smell of powdery white snow. And the first time of me living without fear as a young 20-year-old. And I laughed. A tale of two rabbits, one that was very much alive and died, and one that was very much not alive but came to life. Thank you. Thank you.